I'm recording this because my family won't talk about it anymore. I'm the only one who can't seem to forget. I was raised in the outskirts of Preston, a small town in southern Idaho, with a population of around 5,000. More my immediate community was an isolated, dead-end dirt road called Bear Creek. Less than 20 families lived on Bear Creek. I didn't mind it being so isolated. I grew up in the comfort of wide fields and close neighbours that only rural people know. We are a Mormon community, very church-centred, very community-centred. All the young boys, including myself, were members of the local Boy Scout troop, which doubled as a church group in our area, and all of the girls were a part of the women's group. We had 4th of July parties at the local ballpark, and swam in the nearby reservoir. It was a good, quiet community. My house, a 92-year-old farmhouse built by my great-great-grandfather, was situated on a small hill surrounded by a wide grass field on one side and a snaking dirt road on the other. Across the road was the creek bottoms. Southern Idaho is categorized as a desert climate, so not much grows outside of the irrigated fields besides sagebrush and burrs. The creek bottoms were the exception. The creek fed a growth of thick tangle of pussy willow brushes. In the late fall, we would go down into the bottom and pick the white cotton pussy willow seeds to decorate the fences of our driveway. Being so isolated, it wasn't uncommon for animals to come down from the mountains. We had a female moose who brought a calf down and lived in our orchard every winter, and the occasional lion wasn't unheard of either. The summer, when I was eight, I remember because it was the same year as my baptism, a smaller mountain lion was spotted several miles in our area. We weren't worried, the big cats stayed away from the farms and usually moved on when an area didn't yield enough food. The same summer, my neighbour, Peyton, was working his Eagle Scout project. He loved National Geographic and thought it would be pretty cool to try put together a National Geographic submission on our little creek bottoms. The young lion that happened to be in our area at the time made him especially excited. He decided he wanted to try and get pictures of the lion and emailed the National Geographic team for advice. They recommended setting up an automatic camera that takes shots every couple of seconds in an area the lion was known to visit. They also recommended setting some kind of bait so the lion was more likely to come by. No one in the creek liked the idea of live bait or carrion, so we came up with a different kind of bait. We set up an audio recording of a dying rabbit and played it on loop through a set of speakers hidden in the willows. I remember when everyone was down in the bottoms testing the speakers and I heard the noise for the first time. The sound of a dying rabbit is horrible. It's been described as almost identical to the sound of a screaming child. If you've never heard it yourself, there's plenty of recordings available online, it's worth a listen. The camera was set up, the speakers were set up, everything was perfect. Peyton explained that he would allow the camera and recording to play uninterrupted for a week, and then he'd go and check on it. This would give time for our scent to fade from the bottoms and encourage the lion to come closer. At first, I was worried about the noise. It was a truly horrible noise, and our house was the closest to the setup point in the bottoms. My father assured me that the noise wouldn't reach as far as our house, and I was relieved when we arrived home that night and he was correct. The bottoms were far enough away that I couldn't hear anything. I remember Peyton the next day at church. He was fidgety and excited to check on the equipment. But he had to wait a week, which everybody kept reminding him. He couldn't risk going down too early and scaring the lion away for good. That night, I woke up to an awful noise. I sat ramrod straight in my bed, with my eyes wide in the dark, hands clutched so hard my palms bore the indent of my fingernails for hours after. I knew that noise. It was the recording of the rabbit. 
it sounded faint and far off, like it really could have been coming from the bottoms, but that was impossible, because the recording had been going on all night the previous day and I hadn't heard a thing. I didn't sleep that night, and I was too scared to get out of bed and wake up my parents. The recording played over and over again. I had the loop memorized. In the morning, I stumbled into the kitchen for breakfast. My mum and dad were sitting at the kitchen table. They too had dark rings under their eyes. I hadn't been the only one who heard it. My mum convinced that the equipment must have been broken. She wanted to go down to the bottoms to check it out. Dad refused. He was a kind, gentle man and didn't want to stir up any unnecessary drama. He was sure there had been a strong wind last night, and the wind carried the noise farther than its natural reach. He told us to listen. We did. He was right, we couldn't hear it now. We forgot about it and went about our daily goings. The next night, it happened again. I stayed up in bed with my back to the wall. The screaming was even louder than before, but this time, something was different. It was lower pitched than I remember, and the parts of the loops were slowed down as if the recording were warped in places. At times, the loop did not loop naturally, and instead picked up at a random place in the middle. My mom didn't mention anything at the breakfast table. Both her and my dad seemed tense. The third night, I mustered the courage to stand beside my bedroom window and look out into the yard. For a moment, I stood, rooted to the spot, my hands shaking no matter how hard I clenched them. The noise sidled in through the cracks in the window. I watched the outline of trees in the yard, perfectly still. Not even the slightest breeze stirred their branches. My mum announced that she would be going to visit her sisters in town the next day and would probably spend the night there. She invited me to come along, but I was a daddy's boy at heart and chose to stay with him at the farm. We began to hear the noise during the day too. I was drawing with chalk on the sidewalk when it happened. My shoulders tensed and the hairs on the back of my neck prickled. There was only one scream, a short, high-pitched one, and then the recording fell silent. It happened again several times throughout the day, but never the whole loop, just clips from it. Later that evening, Peyton's dad came up the driveway on his four-wheeler. He said he was looking for their dog, a sweet yellow lab who had been missing since that morning. Dad said he was sorry and that we hadn't seen her. I stared at him, silently begging him to mention the recording, but he didn't. He was a quiet man after all, he didn't want to bring up any unnecessary drama. Mom stayed away the whole week, Dad and I didn't sleep. By Saturday, the screaming could be heard constantly, though it seemed to have deviated from the familiar loop entirely. I didn't recognize any of it. Sometimes the screams were thin and long. Other times they were hardly more than growls. Once, while my dad had been heating up meatloaf for lunch, the noise rose into such a rancorous din that he dropped the plate and it shattered. I pressed my hands over my ears where I sat at the table and squeezed my eyes shut, but it didn't help. The noise forced its way through the cracks of my fingers and pinched my throat and rattled in my ribcage. The din lasted for a whole minute, then fell silent. Dad was shaking. That was the last we heard of the noise that day. Peyton came by Saturday evening to ask permission to cross our road to collect the equipment. He was so excited. I watched him disappear into the creek bottoms with a sense of tired relief. After the equipment was gone, it would all stop. I couldn't wait to get a full night's sleep. Not a minute later I spotted Peyton, coming back up from the creek. I was confused. It had taken us much longer to set up the camera and speakers, so 
I'd only assume it would take just as long to collect them. My breath stilled when Peyton came closer. He didn't look right. His eyes were wide and his face pale. Something wet dribbled from his chin onto his shirt. Later I realized it was vomit. My dad caught him before he fell and demanded to know what had happened. Peyton couldn't speak. He just cried. We called his dad. I looked after Peyton as both my dad and his dad went into the bottoms. They were gone a long time. When they returned, their faces were grim, and they smelled funny. I noticed red on my dad's hands. I asked what was wrong, but they brushed right past me and immediately called the police. Nobody would tell me what had happened. I sat on the couch as a blur of neighbours and police officers swirled around me. At one point, an officer placed something on the kitchen table and left. I looked into the kitchen curiously. It was the camera from the bottoms. I wish I hadn't looked. The camera was a little banged up. Tiny scratches and dents covered the plastic casing. When I lifted it, my hand stuck to the plastic. Something tacky and odorous covered the screen, but it turned on fine. The next set of photos were normal, just the pussy willow cast green in the glow of the night setting. As I continued to click through them, they quickly became strange. At one point, the camera angle changed, as if the camera had been knocked from its post. Grass now obscured most of the frame. Flecks of red appeared on the lens and remained for the rest of the set. One photo made me pause. There was a figure in this one, or half of a figure, as most of the upper torso hadn't made it into the frame. I thought it could be human, but it didn't look like it should be standing upright. Its legs were twisted like an animal, and it seemed to have difficulty supporting itself in an upright position. Beside the legs, a long, thin arm hung. Whatever it was, it must have been stooped over, for its fingertips hung below its crooked knees. The next set was different. It was as if the camera had been picked up and was now being held. The first photo was of the bottoms at night. The next startled me. I had to look closely before deciding what it was. A rabbit had been laid in the bushes, but its ears and most of its scalp had been peeled away. The next was of the same rabbit, but a thin, dark hand was holding it up against the sky. Its limp body hung like something from a nightmare. In the following photos, more rabbits joined the one, each with their ears and scalp removed. Then a cat. Then more cats. Then a dog, the yellow lab, then the lion. The following photo was of seven rabbits, three cats, one dog, and the lion, all laid out in a row, facing the same way. Their arms and legs had been arranged as if they were marching, like some parade. All of their scalps had been removed, and tiny white glints of their skulls could be seen. The last photo was overly bright, like the photo had been taken too close with the flash on. One eye dominated the frame, but it was yellowed and crusty, and had a bar pupil like a horse. In the bottom corner of the edge, a mouth could be seen. No lips, just teeth, sharp and little, with wide gaps of red gum between them. I wish I hadn't looked. I heard my dad talking to the police outside. They said the speakers had malfunctioned. The recording had only played the first night.